You might think they were very different from each other. The Big Bang is very, very dense, very, very hot. The remote future will be very, very rarefied and very, very cold. You've suggested that, you know, perhaps the Big Bang wasn't in fact the beginning. Uh, you've famous for a view called conformal cyclical uh, cosmology. I wondered if you could tell us a bit about this. Yes, well, you see, that was where I finally went. It took me a long time. Mm -hmm. You see, I'd spent ages trying to make sense of bringing quantum mechanics, explaining the singularities that way. And I made a sort of just an assumption about singularities in the past with no justification from physics, just what I used to call the vile curvature hypothesis. Vile curvature is a particular kind of curvature which describes the gravitational field getting very strong rather than the matter getting very strong. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, okay, singularities in the past have got zero vile curvature, just a hypothesis. Can't do much with that. But one of my graduate students, Paul Todd, mm -hmm. he's had a much better way of saying it. He said, why don't you say that you can stretch out the Big Bang. This is a kind of trick I'd use, yeah. use quite a lot, what's called conformal, big and small, stretch out the Big Bang, and it can make it nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. And he says, why don't you say it like that instead? That it's, if you stretch the Big Bang out, then you, it, you can make it smooth. That's basically his criterion. Mm -hmm. That's a much better way of saying it. So I picked up on that, I said, well, why is it so smooth? Yes, well, you see, <laughs> the Big Bang is in a certain sense not singular at all. It's really completely different from the singularities in the future. Why is it not singular at all? Well, it's not singular if you use a kind of geometry which is called conformal geometry. Mm -hmm. Now, conformal geometry is the geometry of angles, if you like, so or shapes, small shapes. It doesn't you forget distances, so big and small are equivalent, but different shapes are inequivalent. Yeah. It's a very useful image to have are these pictures due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher, yes. where he illustrated a particular type of geometry, it's called um, um, hyperbolic geometry, don't worry too much about that, but in these pictures they're called circle limits, and you the most famous ones with angels and devils. You can mm -hmm. see the angels and devils in the middle, and as you get towards the edge, you can still, the, the shapes of them are pretty well the same, but they're much, much smaller. Much smaller. Yeah. And you can see right up to the edge, I mean, I've looked at these <laughs> pictures of Esh, I've been seeing the, some of the originals, some of them. they're absolutely yeah. amazing. You can look right up the edge, and he's actually made them very, very precise yeah. to the edge. So the picture is that the universe, this is now for, just for the Big Bang. No, don't think we're around. <laughs> just for infinity. The remote yeah. future can be squashed down to make it a boundary. Yes. And I used to do this trick in studying gravitational radiation, gravitational mm -hmm. waves. In order to study them nicely and to see how much energy they carry and things like that, it's useful to squash down infinity. Yes. And then you can see, you've got a nice boundary at the edge and you can do your calculations. Yeah. Rather than taking horrible limits and things, which I'm not very good at doing, but <laughs> looking at the geometry yes. of the squash down infinity. Yes. So you can squash down infinity, and now that we have this thing people misleadingly refer to as dark energy, mm -hmm. it's really Einstein's cosmological constant, mm -hmm. which he introduced for the wrong reason just after he introduced his theory. He wanted a static universe, and he needed this extra term. When he was persuaded that the universe was not static, but was actually expanding, he ditched his cosmological mm -hmm. constant, which was a mistake. Ah. He regarded the introduction of this number, this constant, as his biggest blunder. But the trouble is that Einstein's blunders even turned out to be true <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and this one actually, Something like that turns out to be true of the universe. So yeah. you actually do have this expanding universe in the future, which is doing this exponential expansion now, and you can squash it down, and it squashes down rather nicely. Yes. Squashes down to find 
a space-like boundary, which means really it's a, it's a time in a sense. It's mm -hmm. it's time infinity, but it's like a, a honest mm -hmm. time. And when you squash it down, it makes a nice smooth boundary. So you've got a nice smooth boundary at the beginning, which is stretched out Big Bang, and the nice smooth boundary at the end, mm -hmm. squashed down infinity. You might think they are very different from each other. The Big Bang is very, very dense, very, very hot. The remote future will be very, very rarefied and very, very cold. But when you squash, the temperature goes up. Mm -hmm. When you stretch, the temperature goes down. The density and temperature go down at the beginning, and they, they go up at the future. And I thought, well, I really rather like each other. <laughs> <laughs> you might think that this really cold, rarefied, remote future is completely, utterly different from the Big Bang, where you've got hot, dense. But when you do this conformal stuff, stretch out the Big Bang, squash down the finish, they pretty like each other. So I thought, mm -hmm. well, maybe they're not just like each other, maybe they really are. Not the same, I wouldn't go that far. Mm. But the, the Big Bang is the continuation of the remote future mm -hmm. of a previous eon, I'm calling mm -hmm. it. So rather, not, rather than calling it our universe, which begins with the Big Bang and ends at the remote future, yeah. I'm saying that's one eon. I like to spell it in the A-E-O-N because yeah. it's a little <laughs> exotic. So the Big Bang was the continuation of somebody else's eon yeah. prior to ours, our eon in the remote future, will be the, the continued into mm -hmm. the Big Bang of this remote future. It's a crazy idea, <laughs> but not so crazy as it doesn't make sense mathematically and physically. Yeah. And it's, it's so the, what, what looks like the, the, past, the past infinity for us is somebody else's future infinity, yeah, so it's yeah, exactly. cyclical in that sense. Yes, of our, our past, eons and, yeah. Our past Big Bang was the remote future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to give lectures on this thinking, I, nobody will ever be able to prove me wrong and so I can go <laughs> on talking about this forever. <laughs> and then I thought, hey, maybe there is a way of proving <laughs> So I thought about signals which might get through. Mm -hmm. And the first idea I had about this was collisions between supermassive black holes. You see, we yep. are in, our galaxy is in a cluster of galaxies there's the Andromeda galaxy, which is actually a lot bigger than us. Their black hole is much bigger than ours. Yeah. We are in a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. Mm -hmm. In a few thousand million years, it, we will, the things will come together. And our black holes, well, they won't hit each other straight away, but they'll feed each other out mm -hmm. a few more thousand million years. And they'll spiral into each other. It will uh, go, go up our one down and have it for dinner. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's much snack. bigger than us. But nevertheless, that will produce a huge gravitational wave impulse, yeah. which will go out. And, okay, that, we won't see much of that. We won't be around by then. But, However, things like that in the previous eon yes. will produce gravitational wave signals, mm -hmm. which we might be able to see. see. Right. And I claim that we do see them. And these are seen. The initial analysis was done by my Armenian colleague, mm -hmm. Vahe Gerzajan. A lot of people complained about the way he did it and all that. And, and you could see from the pictures, there's something going on. It's, yeah. It just, you can't, it's not fluke. There's something going on there. Some Polish colleagues, headed by Krzysztof Meisner, did the analysis completely differently. Mm -hmm. And they found distinct evidence that these yeah. ring structures that you would see in the sky are actually there. Mm -hmm. Then I had another idea of what I call any hawking points. You see, this is getting back to the black holes. The black holes sit around and sit around and sit around and sit around. They do slightly radiate. This mm -hmm. is hawking evaporation. Yeah. They don't do that until they're hotter than the background. Yeah. Black holes are extremely cold. However, the universe is expanding, 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 and it gets colder and colder and colder. And ultimately, the rest of the universe gets colder than the black hole. Mm -hmm. Then it starts to radiate away. It's all this entropy stuff you yeah. were asking me before. <laughs> and the, it radiates away and finally disappears in a pop. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the ultimate fate of a cluster of galaxies in our eon. Mm -hmm. 
So that'll happen to us eventually. <laughs> and this black hole swallows everything else, dominates everything, doesn't swallow all the matter, probably most of it. Mm -hmm. And then it shrinks away because of it loses mm -hmm. its energy by hawking evaporation. All that gets squashed through into a teeny teeny weensy point into the next eon, yeah. and you get a burst of radiation, which would reach something like eight times the diameter of the moon, mm -hmm. because you don't see you don't see the radiation for three hundred and eighty thousand years. Wow. Three hundred and eighty thousand years. It's the photons and the light well, energy is jiggle around only when 380,000 years happens and they can start to leak out. Mm -hmm. And by then, the, what would have been a point reaches what we now see is eight times the diameter of the moon, so I claim. <laughs> and we see those spots. Wow. Those spots are with a confidence level of 99.98. I, I don't do the statistics, I rely on my colleagues for that. 99.98% confidence level that these spots are actually there. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.